Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming uh, to this event uh, by the Center for European Studies. I'm Geneviève Zabriski. I'm director of the Center for European Studies and the Wiser Center for Europe and Eurasia. Um, before introducing our guests, um, I'd like to say a few words about upcoming events. Um, the main one, after today's distinguished lecture, um, is a very special event on February 20th. Um, so a few days before the anniversary of the full-scale invasion of Ukraine by the Russian Federation, we will have uh, Lieutenant Colonel um, Alexander Vindman, who will be coming to campus um, and uh, speaking with us at the Rackham Auditorium. So it's Monday, 5 p.m., February 20th. And after about an hour conversation with him, uh, there will be a, a brief concert uh, from local members of Detroit area, Midwest uh, area of the Bandurist Chorus of North America for about 30 minutes of Ukrainian music, followed by a procession to the Diag where we will have a candle lit uh, vigil. So I really encourage you to come to that event. It is free to the public, but you do need to get tickets. So if you go to our website, Google WCEE UMISH, uh, you will see you can obtain free tickets, print them, and come. Um, Rackham has a large, I think we have a thousand seats, but actually tickets are likely to go. So I encourage you to get tickets as soon as possible. Um, and now, I'm very pleased to uh, introduce our speaker and to also uh, present um, the Center. So the Center for European Studies is dedicated to improving understanding of European history and the European Union in the 21st century. CES brings together more than 100 faculty uh, in more than 20 departments across the nine colleges at the University of Michigan. So it's a large collective of individuals whose research is primarily around Europe. And these faculty affiliates regularly teach and conduct research on a wide variety of themes related to Europe, training the next generation of scholars in European studies. Each year, CES holds a, a distinguished lecture on Europe. And for this event, we invite a particularly interesting and broad-minded thinker to challenge us to think about new ways about a specific country of Europe, but about Europe or European history more broadly. Its history, its current state, its future. And today we have the distinct pleasure and honor to host Victoria de Grazia, who is the more collegiate professor emerita of history at Columbia University. Professor de Grazia has a long and distinguished career, and her research interests lie, lie in uh, contemporary history with long-standing commitments to setting Western Europe and Italy from a gendered pers perspective and to developing also a global perspective on commercial revolutions. Her publications include The Culture of Consent, Mass Organization of Leisure in Fascist Italy, in 19, published in 1981, uh, How Fascism Ruled Women, Italy, 1922-1945, uh, she also edited uh, a volume entitled The Sex of Things, Gender and Consumption in Historical Perspective, uh, in Irresistible Empire, America's Advance Through 20th Century Europe in 2005, and most recently, The Perfect Fascist, A Story of Love, Power, and Morality in Mussolini's Italy. So we're very excited to hear what she has to say today on the invention of fascist governmentality. And uh, we will have time uh, after the lecture for um, a lively Q&A. Um, and for now, I ask you that you join me in welcoming Professor Victoria de Grazia. Thank you hugely for having me uh, visit here, uh, be, to be present physically as opposed to being uh, in, in contact by Zoom. And I especially want to thank Genevieve 
um, Zabriskie for having invited me. It was really a, a, tr a treat I was looking forward to for, for about a year now. And let me also thank uh, Magosha um, Kowalski, who provided for the, for the logistics and were generally the center uh, for European study studies, and behind that, the, the wiser um, center. So today, I wanted to speak off of a, a paper, so there'll be some informality here. I hope not too much slippage. Uh, on the topic okay, of the, fasc the invention of fascist governmentality. I made some changes here. And Italy's reach for hegemony, 1925 to 1943. So a little change in date, 43 uh, being uh, the year of the Battle of Stalingrad, which I'm going to make an argument for was the, the, the first major uh, defeat uh, of the Nazi fascist new order uh, in the name of anti-fascism, largely, I mean, wholly at the hands of um, the Soviet Union with, with, with aid from its allies. Um, uh, I want to uh, see, connect then this invention of fascist governmentality. That sounded a little static, and some of you might have sniffed uh, the static, sometimes static hand of Michel Foucault there. I wanted to tie that term, fascist governmentality, to uh, what it was used for, and that's something quite dynamic. That is Italy's challenge to the international liberal order from 1925. That date is the moment that Mussolini basically <coughs> declares his dictatorship openly, uh, when we can begin to think of him as a having more or less uh, brought in the elites of Italy, except really for the church, we'll talk about that, and take it then to 1943, okay, uh, the date at which I think we can safely say that uh, the challenge to the international liberal order is uh, over, uh, and yet still uh, hope springs, uh, projects still bloom, uh, which have the fascists trying to imagine still what a post-war new order should uh, look like with some elements that then are reprised uh, in the creation of uh, Europe, United Europe, after World War II. So let me start. A couple of years ago, I wrote an opinion piece for a very interesting West Coast uh, digital journal, Zocalo Square, it, you know, to express my, my unease at the misuse of the term fascism. So, you know, be, professor, but academic, sticking to my comfort of my uh, specialization. I, you know, it's, I, I said that really we have to take the problem of fascism very seriously. Uh, look, let's look okay, at the period of classical fascism and then we'll really get how seriously we need to take it. Um, what I then uh, focused on was the fact that fascism as a third way between American-style capitalism, plutocratic, monopoly capitalism, however it, you know, many adjectives you put in, and uh, Soviet uh, Bolshevism, uh, uh, that it was taken very seriously in the interwar period as a third way. Indeed, as a quintessentially European response, which then was regarded as having all kinds of global emulators and extensions, Okay. Um, that it was not merely reactionary, nor simply anti-liberal, anti-Semitic, anti-this, anti-that, and so on. But rather, it was viewed as addressing some major issues of a period of terrible crisis, of what some called an interregnum, what my colleague, I think Adam Trues, <laughs> might call a polycrisis. Okay. And indeed, that I went further to hazard, the anti-fascist movements were extremely fragmented and wouldn't become effective until the alliance was developed during World War II between very unlike regimes, that is the American, the Soviet, uh, and the British to cover over many of their differences of 
system uh, and to engage then uh, the Nazi fascist new order on the battlefield. And I hazarded as well, as I, far as I could tell, between the anti-fascist victory at Guadalajara in Spain uh, when some voluntary um, groups together with a, a, a Spanish Republican militia defeated the Italian voluntary uh, expedition to Spain, spring of 1937, until the Battle of Stalingrad, I couldn't really think of a battle won against the Nazi fascists, or uh, including the Axis, let's say including Japan, that had been won in the name of anti-fascism. Okay. Now these are pretty strong claims, and I have been racking my head ever since about how I could be able in a relatively what the things I could argue in a relatively brief piece uh, could be um, argued more fully. And today I'm taking the occasion to experiment with some trepidation, a lot of loose strings, many balls in the air to, you, to try to clarify uh, th further my thoughts. Of course, I hadn't made up that argument whole cloth, to say the least, uh, at least since 1945. Indeed, and since the late 30s, Western historians have been attracted to the study of fascism because, indeed, it challenged all of the post-1945 conceptions about the liberal unfolding of practice. I'm sorry, uh, post-World uh, War I conceptions about the liberal unfolding of, of progress. And the closer scholars uh, were to the events of the interwar period, the more they recognized that in the face of the crisis in Europe, um, and uh, uh, that it, the crisis of Europe was connected to Europe being toppled from its place of preeminence and reacting to that decline by bringing forth the most violent and calamitous dimensions of its past history. I think here, for example, of the German emigre scholar uh, uh, from Leipzig, Sigmund Neumann, who in his 1946 uh, work, The Future in Perspective, made a comparison between the 30 years war of the early 20th century, 1915-1945, during which Euro Europe uh, was faced with the decline of the modern European state system as a center of global power, with the 30-year crisis of the 17th century and the rise of the modern European state system. And that always thought me as deeply thought-provoking uh, sort of way to try to situate then fascism's global trajectory in a longer period of European history, okay? not simply, uh, uh, shall we say, as the beginning of uh, the background of our uh, 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 present. In the last decade or so, however, the study of historical fascism has been greatly enriched for our purposes here. And our purpose here is to revisit how a relatively small nation state, I'm thinking of Italy here, but one can also think of Germany too, uh, uh, at least in the wake of World War I, uh, uh, how small these countries were, how resource uh, starved, how uh, in some sense, uh, dispossessed they were in the wake of World uh, War I in the face of the rising hegemons of that epoch, namely the United States on the one hand uh, and the USSR, or with respect to the leading Euro European imperial powers, Britain and France, um, how, uh, uh, how to think then about how they could pose such a challenge to the liberal order, these relatively small powers that had been reestablished with such effort by the victorious states of the Entente, including Italy, uh, informed by American principles and pivoting around the League of Nations uh, 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 and the principles of the Peace of Versailles. Um, I have been particularly stimulated in my thinking by uh, strong veins of critical and comparative international history, uh, which I can't cite here, which is quite significant now, uh, talking especially about the Nazi fascist new order and the continuities uh, between the interwar period and uh, the even European Union, the notions of European unity in the post-war era. Okay, this, this history sees the great challenges that emerge for non-imperial nation states coming out of World War I. Um, we see uh, their, 
their difficulties, particularly in the realm of how they were going to manage their relatively scarce resources in the face of the challenges presented by the Versailles system, in the face of a more and more deglobalizing uh, a, a global economy. This is the subject of a very recent work that's come out by Tara Zara, who speaks of you know, deglobalization, the mass movements which are in, in, against uh, globalization. She argued, or, or in the face of deglobalization, which she, which she includes the Nazi uh, fascists, but also Gandhi and other, uh, many other movements. Um, the problems they face with rising nationalism, with closing off of markets and of emigration, together with the growing importance of models of empire, I refer here to the United States and to the Soviet Union, uh, but also to the British and French uh, empires that, pro uh, uh, not to them in terms of size, but to the latter two, that is the United States, former two of the United States and the USSR, that prize higher and higher productivity, um, mo strong models of market organization, whether through uh, corporate structures in the United States um, and th or, th or through planning, higher standards of living, more or less, and uh, the economic and ideological integration through shared ways of consumption, even if in the Soviet Union they were very, very low by comparison to the United States. If we map the challenges of the United States, um, um, uh, uh, to, of the United States, of Britain's abiding hegemony and the USSR, uh, we, we could say outright uh, that this was a grave difficulty for Italy's uh, both old elite and its new fascist elite coming to power after 1932 uh, uh, that had to be faced. So leave aside, taking Italy now, the sheer devastation of World War I. In the United States, uh, Italy could see an enormous new economic power grown hugely by the war and a creditor state, an empire all but name, a model of industrialism which prized the so-called new Fordist man, white, decently waged and ununionized, a giant pretty much closed market, and an emigration policy instated in just after the war and then reiterated in 1924, which after several days of welcoming Italian immigrants, mostly at the lowest levels of, uh, of, of, labor, of the labor value chain, had started to exclude them even as Italian emigration once more soared. Not only its ex exclusion from the United States reaffirmed that Italian immigrants indeed belonged at the bottom of the racial, uh, of the labor scale in terms of their poor racial quality in which they were equated with you know, the Chinese, also even with Negro labor, initially many, many uh, went um, uh, to, uh, into farms, into industries that had been attached to uh, the agricultural uh, arenas. More, moreover, it, the Italy needed U.S. capital if it was to stabilize, much less grow. H hence, internally, it could not pursue a, pro uh, a, a, a way toward higher uh, wages. Uh, it, it, it had to stay a low-wage area. In the British Empire, fascist Italy would see a selfish, off-and-on senior partner who, when the going was good during the era of late 19th century free trade, was happy to have Italy as a junior partner in the Horn of Africa. But in the post-war world, in the name of Western liberal white hegemony, with the U US, the back of the United States, had dismissed Italy's claims to colonies for settlement and to show, too, that uh, 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 Italy's claims that it too had a civilizing mission, uh, reinforcing its claims with further extension of its, um, uh, uh, to pretend more and more from the League of Nations. Mm -hmm. Finally, there was the Soviet Union, pushed back behind its borders by containment, yet still for Italians, especially those like the fascists who knew of the Soviet Union through their connections with their socialist past, Yet the Soviet Union still uh, uh, provided the model of a new worker civilization, and as it emulated Fordism, embarked on agricultural form and the planned economy, um, promised I mean, with its big population, its giant domestic market, uh, to him in Christian Europe, with its aggressive world revolutionism, its materialist ideology, and what was more and more denounced from the early 1920s, its Jewish, Judeo-Bolshevik conspiratorial politics. We can come 
back later, perhaps, to say how did um, that extraordinarily powerful myth grow up. Now, in my effort to understand how a relatively small state actor could be so disruptive, especially as it formed an axis with more powerful state, um, namely Nazi Germany, later Japan, and a swath of weaker ones, I saw Mussolini uh, not uh, just as a master golpista, okay, high craft as a leader of the uh, uh, anti-movement that then became the fascist party, but also developing uh, a, as a master uh, state, statesman. Okay? So though I don't intend to give an intentionalist account that sees Mussolini as all-powerful, I do see him as a skilled strategist here, who for two decades, 1940, 1920 to 1940, when I think on many grounds he, he lost it, was a skilled strategist, as the past leader of revolutionary socialism in Italy, a former internationalist, a professional journalist of very strong, good qualities, an intellectual poser, certainly, uh, but also a quick study as a junior statesman who at one point or another, after he comes to power in 1922, uh, is turning to several cohorts of collaborators, some exceptionally cosmopolitan, erudite, a, including a, a, a big mix of old elites. As one liberal statesman, Vittorio Shaloya, a jurist, a, Italy's representative to uh, the League of Nations, uh, the son of one of Italy's sort of George Washingtons, a liberal, pure and through and through, a jurist commented of his effort to mentor Mussolini about international relations, distinctly intelligent. He doesn't always get it. But when he does, he really does. Shall I also ask, added patronizingly, he does lack a sense of economy, politics, and justice, however. Okay. I would date that, uh, I, I would argue that we should date from October 28, 1925, the celebration of the March on Rome, um, the moment at which Mussolini articulates his first programmatic statement about how he will be ruling in the wake of declaring his dictatorship uh, the prior June, excuse me, January 1925. Um, in, in the 10 months since January, he had outlawed the opposition. He had used the state's police powers to censor the media. He was bringing his own very disquiet mass party uh, 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 militia under the reign rule of the minister of the interior who in the liberal state had handled questions of law and order. And he was equivocating about whether he should engage with the spirit of Locarno okay, to join France, Germany, and Britain to police one another. Uh, or he should play hmm, the rogue state uh, to some future uh, advantage. What is striking about this speech that he makes in La Scala uh, to a major audi an audience of major leaders of industry and finance, the media, the political hierarchs, and the heads of local government, is he makes laughs at this, draws, draws a big laugh, that he had managed to pass 3,000 measures since he had come to power in, uh, in November 1932, uh, 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 but largely because he didn't have to su submit any of them to the approval of the 535 dot 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 worthies. Okay only then to start up again, okay, so no more parliament that is blocking, obstructing legislation, that uh, the end of the liberal regime was not enough for the future of the whole country. So he's moving on from the, you know, the first anti-liberal political liberalism. He said the liberal state that had made the nation had failed to make the state. Last century was the century of our independence. This century has to be the century of our empowerment. Okay? The one logical conclusion okay, is that this is about then the state now leading everything. And this is you what know, we associate with you know, conventional ideas of totalitarianism. Indeed, this is the speech, again, before this, this we want the estates general of the bourgeoisie of Italy, in which he says, our formula is this, everything in the state, nothing outside of the state, and nothing against the state. But I argue here that he's not speaking of limitless power as in conventional liberal notions of totalitarianism, 
okay, which usually argue for the kind of submergent of the masses in the leader and vice versa, the submergence of the leader uh, in the, the masses. So there is no longer a civil society. But he's talking about a specific kind of system of power, uh, which will not only be the expression of narrow bourgeois interests, uh, nor is he only going to be using the power of the state apparatus. We're getting a little bit conventionally understood nor one party rule as the major arm of, uh, of government. He recalls here the power mobilized to fight a total war uh, that Italy is now facing. He says that Italy is facing the competition of peoples in the arena of world civilization. This recalls then, one would say, ah, wartime government, the, this analogy. Right? and that he's mobilizing uh, wartime government as the liberal state had, had, had done. But he moves beyond as if he's searching for a new a vocabulary uh, of governance. Okay? His rule, he says, is not going to be a change of cabinet, but a whole new political regime, not a fascist government in the sense that the party, that it, the, the regime is a party of deputies okay, of the fascists, a coalition type government but he says a new conception of power that takes what is very, most vital from every program and employs the force to put it into effect. So very conscious then now of the, to the morality of what he's doing. Uh, he, uh, he will seize every opportunity and he will always be waiting how much persuasion and how much force needs to be done uh, to, uh, to, to, to achieve uh, the power he is arguing. Uh, that, that Italy needs uh, in order to become, become empowered in the 20th uh, century. What I want to do is call that this here fascist governmentality. Okay? So something more than regime, something very different from simply governance, not the state because it also involves this uh, civil society, it also involves the mar market forces, private enterprise, and so on and so forth. Okay? Um, he will indeed be using the conventional state apparatus. He will indeed be using his party militia. He will indeed be using uh, public and private media. He will also, however, be using an alliance system, one with the church. It's going to turn out the other, a very particular kind of alliance, which will, I will argue, take shape in the axis. Okay? Uh, in, in what we might call, say then, is governmentality then is the framework and he's going to be developing out of it sort of strategies. What, when I spoke of the, in the United States of how the United States exercises power uh, in uh, irresistible empire, I spoke of social inventions and so far as they could use the market behind them a certain kind of entrepreneurial thinking about how uh, power could be used. He is adding up then as he moves forward what Italy's resources are to become, acquire this new power using these forces of governmentality. Great emphasis on Italy's natural resources that, you know, where it lies in the Mediterranean Sea. Strong, big em emphasis on the population uh, uh, as labor, for, as, for, as a force of, of labor and of reproduction. Emphasis on the nature of Italian capital and the big dependency it has on getting foreign capital emphasis on Italy's geopolitical position. He is also calculating about resources from the past. And that's from a study, I think, of soft power. He thinks of you know, Erdogan in Turkey, neo-Ottomanism. Okay. We speak now of Russia's hybrid power, how much is drawing on a past, almost giving, giving it a materiality. We think of Brazil's exercise of soft power when it was merging as one of the BRICs, and they speak often of Brazil's pride in not having waged war so with its neighbors and having a very special re relationship with Africa. So these are myths, but they're also grounded in uh, you know, cer certain, if you want, material re relations. He's calculating then Italy has and was Rome. Okay, uh, Italy uh, 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 was a, the place of humanism. Italy had unique traditions, if you want, of uh, p political economic thinking and mercantilism and in, was distinguished by its uh, re, uh, very, very interesting political theoretical traditions and Italy has Catholicism. 
In other words, he's bent on employing notions of means of government that hadn't existed under the liberal state uh, to advance, if you want, uh, Italy's position. Okay? Um, it, they are in the realm of force, clearly, but they are also in the realm of persuasion, I want to argue. Now, it's not casual that I want to use uh, the notion fascist governmentality to characterize that fascist art of governance. Okay. In earlier works, I was very mindful of how much Mussolini paid attention to the population question. Okay. He wrote a book on, on after work organization, wrote a work on uh, a women's movement. Um, while I was writing uh, the work on, on women, how fascists rule women, there were at least a couple of very well done books on eugenics and population politics. This is the 1990s, uh, both of whom use the notion of biopolitics, drawing from Michel Foucault. Okay? Uh, according to that line, which I wasn't, I wasn't really using, okay, uh, fascism was, uh, was particularly totalitarian. Uh, it was particularly intrusive in applying politics to the body of new men and new women. Um, in reality, I became much interested uh, from another direction in Michel Foucault's work. So biopolitics is a, is a word that appears in his, not, I think, 1979, uh, 78, 79 lectures. Okay? And it was, you know, so sort of ran like wildfire because it equated the welfare state with fascism, all totalitarian, uh, and it was very, it seemed to be very effective, and I found it really not, not very effective and rather, rather static. But I became interested from another uh, direction to realize that at the very moment that Mussolini was cracking down on the opposition, uh, cracking down on representation, whether through parliament or through trade unions or through the pluralism of the media, okay, or even his own party, okay, he was, in effect, changing the very idea of politics. Okay? He was moving from the idea of the people and their rights to uh, legitimate their sovereign, to be represented okay, in government, the legacy of the French Revolution, to which early fascism was connected, the source of liberal politics, the source of, fa uh, of socialism and early fascism, to the idea of the population, which had no rights except to be tended to, to keep it alive at very least. So that, that, that seems to be part of the, the contract. Okay. So this is very remarkable, I found, in his first major speech, okay, May 26, 1927, where he addresses the fascist chamber of deputies. The speech is called the speech of ascension perhaps four hours long, 78 printed pages. He himself says he worked for weeks and weeks on it. He didn't give other speeches. He consulted, you can see, vast numbers of experts, leading experts. The occasion is the presentation of the budget for the Ministry of Home Affairs. He wants to use this speech to make the nation face itself, okay, and to lay out what it will be uh, 1940 uh, to 1945. It will be a people of 60 million, rather than the present 40, with an army of 5 million, prosperous, a leading power. Nice, nothing wrong with that. The New York Times gave it huge coverage. The problem, he said, uh, was then the fact that the other empires had much larger populations, if you counted their uh, empires, as well as their metropolises. Excuse me. Italy had, still had this very large immigration. Uh, and population was tending to decline. There was the poor quality of Italians. You get tuberculosis, a lot of alcoholism, lots of illiteracy, and so on and so forth. Okay? In other words, he's taking up the problem of the growth of the population, and he's doing so in a systematically anti-liberal way, saying now the state has a right to intervene, okay? To, to, to determine all right, uh, how you will reproduce okay, in order to produce on behalf of, the, uh, of Italy. Uh, he 
is addressing now not only the masses out there, the, the people, the sheep, if you want. You know, he uses, he uses lots of different metaphors on that score. Sheep are sometimes good, sometimes they're, they're not. Um, uh, he, he, he's speaking of the middle classes particularly, arguing that hedonism le leads to a reduction in population. He suggests a whiplash uh, against males, uh, unmarried males, bachelors, a tax to offset the cost, indeed, of uh, uh, of, of a setting, setting up uh, uh, operations to help mothers with illeg illegitimate children, which will there be, later become a kind of showpiece for the fascist regime, widely expanded to accommodate mothers and children. But well before that, we see the regime building up systems of family allocations, birth prizes, marriage prizes. We see the disincentives in the way of ban to, to, to uh, declining, uh, uh, to uh, uh, interrupting uh, births uh, by ban on abortion, being turned into a crime of state uh, with jail terms. Um, we see even talk, like in Romania, uh, of registering all pregnancies to prevent abortions. Okay? In other words, we're beginning to see, in the, uh, as a result of this 1920 speech, but also early coming into office, a strong attention on the population and ways of controlling uh, the fertility of the population. Okay. Uh, but it's more than that. He's also pushing in the same speech to worries about you know, the territory and how to control the territory. He's always also very, very worried about the borders. He's also very, very worried about how to push people into a regime of austerity. Uh, that is to cut their consumption. Partly this is done by cutting wages. Partly it is done by decommodifying labor, cut wages, but grow services around the workplace, which uh, you know, make all kinds of claims on behavior in order to be paid off. He's speaking about moving people into the rural areas, not as laborers with, with earning cash, but rather sharecroppers, where they will get returns, a large family unit, as a result of their labor in the countryside. So a particular kind of rural family that will be semi-autarkic and which will need to grow its numbers in order to provide a labor force for larger and larger you know, variable sizes, pieces of land to get the contract. Okay. Um, he's also speaking then of an enlarged family with the woman at the center. So female labor not salaried, uh, but, and and, but it's understood as not paid labor and more and more intensified. Again, uh, uh, an economist, a colleague of mine, uh, economist were asking, well, you know, how could you ever commodify, let's say, uh, the calculate the contribution of women, let's say, going into World War II, with, let's say in Germany, when they're told to keep at home. And he said, well, you know, it could be 20% of the of, of, of the GNP. We, we can't even know how much uh, is, is contributed by, by labor, women's labor in the, in the household. The argument there being that there was a good reason the Nazis kept women at home. It added all sorts of, uh, of, of, of value uh, to, uh, to the household during the war economy. Okay. Now, this brought me okay, to uh, thinking once more ab about Foucault only if you want by chance, because I was reading for some other purposes, the idea of Europe, his work from 1977-78 uh, at the College of France, his lectures on territory, security, and population. I said, my goodness, those are pop Mussolini and his speech, I said, population, territory, and security. Hey, do they read each other? No, I mean, you know, it, but it, I was very curious about this. Uh, what Foucault was doing there, however, is related to this project. He was examining, developing a genealogy of changing traditions of European statecraft to understand the emergence of the welfare state, especially notable in the 1970s when there was so much talk about, in France particularly, about l'état providential, you know, historians working in relationship to Foucault. And he saw this, that this was, basically not conventional politics, which he's not interested in any case, but a new kind, and then next year he'll be talking about biopolitics. Okay? And he called this at the time governmentality. 
and he traces it back to Italian political theory uh, in the 7th, 16th century. He says Machiavelli right, was interested in politics, in how to control the people, okay, to make them either love you or hate you, and to protect the borders so you would be thrown out by your, your neighbors. He was worried in, if you want, uh, a, a, a very, a, a certainty, okay, which wasn't, he said, capitalist, this is Foucault. Well, whom he liked is a man named um, uh, 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 Giovanni, uh, 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 Giuseppe, excuse me, Botero, who, a Piedmontese Jesuit, who was responsible for these big tomes on uh, reason of state, who uh, comes after Machiavelli, and who was very, very interested in how the absolute um, uh, monarch dealt with the problem of population, which in a mercantile system, a closed system, is absolutely key if you want to develop you know, kind of early capitalism, capitalist circulation. Now, what um, Foucault did in a kind of interesting way is there he says, you know, that's because Machiavelli, he's coming out of that tradition, Greco-Roman political theory, that's basically only concerned with government and how you govern. Whereas Botero, he argues, is really concerned with cap growing the economy, with political economy, and therefore he's very interested in all the ways, governmentality, you manage population. Not only, he says, you know, that Foucault coming out of the Greco-Roman tradition is then interested in politics in the conventional way, representation, legitimation. He says, ah, but Botero is coming out of a Catholic, a Judeo-Catholic tradition, which says that the monarch's duty is basically pastoral. That is, a flock, a relation, of, if you want, of the monarch to his flock. That they survive, okay? that they be nurtured, <laughs> yeah, they, they may have to be slaughtered and culled and so on and so forth. But so this I thought was very interesting because now Mussolini himself has created in his regime this difference between all of the apparatus of representation, which we'll come back to, and all of the apparatus, apparatus which is supposed to be governing, if you want, the population, as not as people, but as a resource for growing the power of the state. Now, all right, you might say, oh, so what? Well, what this does then is sort of begin to move, all right, that this aspect of fascist policy found a great deal of attention uh, abroad to say that fascism is actually figuring out now, not having to worry about representative government, how you can develop a more and more elaborate state apparatus uh, of intervention Okay, bringing in private experts, goodness knows, organize people in mass organizations to take advantage of this, which has nothing to do with their rights to uh, have you know, government. Okay, it's an area which, if you want, like the problem with COVID, right, which is going to be addressed by science, expertise, and the state, uh, whereas you know, it, it's very difficult for that to be addressed through conventional politics by voting on, you know, uh, on, on developing uh, you know, uh, uh, pharmaceuticals, medicine, and so on and so forth. So the idea is that a state that's authoritarian is in a much better position to think about, conceptualize what population is, and to address it. Now, this involves, however, moves that I think are very important because we're going to see now population as a very central, where he's going to be basing then Italy's right to be imperialist on you know, handling his population, growing his population, sh showing how vital that they are, that they need then this space ab abroad. But he makes then a, 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 at least a one very important move in this, and that is to bring the Catholic Church back in uh, as a kind of co-ruler, right? shades of the past, you might say, to recognize, um, uh, 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 to co-ruler over the Italians insofar as they are members of the Catholic faith, okay? but also to recognize fascist Italy as the protector of Catholicism as a universal face. Okay? So this is not something called cleroco-fascism. Okay, which sees priests and party hacks, you know, saying, okay, you know, let's organize together the masses and we reinforce each other. I'm giving you a kind of simple-minded vision. Nor is it what's called the sacralization of politics, whereby the fascist, par fascist um, 
uh, oceanography organization takes rituals from the Catholic Church and has you know, Mussolini as Jesus, or you know uses all the uh, analogies and forms, taking you know to create boundless faith, all right, which has been been argued. This is truly a, a, a realignment of forces that lend one a powerful theocratic element to fascist governmentality, at the same time as the fascist state offers itself to the world as the secular protector of the universalism of the church. And whenever it tends to colonize, its civilizing mission uh, works hand in hand uh, to promote church missionary work, and sometimes done even in the name of bringing in uh, the non-Catholics into the fold of the church. The church, meanwhile, is engaged itself in a veritable counter-reformation. Okay? Uh, and this is doing on its own to confront Protestantism, uh, to confront Bolshevism, okay? to confront the fact that with the breakup of empires, especially Catholic empires, it needs to now have treaties. In other words, the church itself is becoming more of a state with the apparatus of a state, more of have more of a, a real civil society in Catholic organizations that cut across, okay? and uh, to also uh, work out uh, uh, a, a new, doct doct new doctrines whose substance, you might say, is to contest okay, modern gender theory. All the basis for contesting uh, modern gender theory can be traced into the encyclicals of Pius the Eleventh, which puts in. 1930, in this famous encyclical called On the Purity of Marriage, marriage as a center, if you want, of the society, a sacrament that can't be dissolved because it's really a marriage between two people and Jesus, and therefore you can't go back on it. I mean, I'm being a little vulgar here, but it, it sets that up. And then there are all sorts of implications then uh, in, in terms of, um, uh, obviously, for uh, marriage laws within the fascist state. Populationism also becomes a prevalence for and gives legitimacy to proletarian imperialism. Okay. The fascist uh, Italy had a right to claim, it's, it, it was said, its equitable portion of lands and resources of the world, which were in large measure uh, under um, imperial, uh, uh, Western imperial rule, especially in Africa. Italy figured as a proletarian nation in a plutocratic system. Italy had a superior civilizing mission, Catholic, large vital population, technologies, ships and airplanes, and a long experience on this score dating back to Rome. So it's very important that reference back. Let's just see here what I can do here. OK. okay. Uh, from 1927, we see Italy making a leap forward in, colo in colon colonialism. The, fir one, the first area is in reclaiming land in what's becoming known as the metropolis. Right. See, I'm see these. Well, let's go one step further. We can come back to that. Okay. So here we have the, 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 the leading new town, Litoria, and you can see you know the, the enormous planning effort. There are about 150 of these towns spread. This is what the largest throughout Italy, Sicily, mainly in these Pontine marshes around Rome, also on the borders with uh, uh, of the Adriatic uh, confining on um, the old Austrian Hungary. Uh, Hungary. So you know, the, 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 the fields are all been cut out of these reclaimed lands. Uh, and so, so this internal, if you want, colonization, uh, which uh, uh, costly, but with the idea that uh, uh, this will reconfigure the households to give new agency to co co colonize the enterprise. Italy is leading the way in the application of agrarian planning, expertise uh, behind protectionist walls, big state research investments in seed, tractors, chemical fertilizer, favoring great, the great northern firms. This is, if you want, a couple of years before three, sometimes four, before we'll see the same happening in the United States. Think of the Tennessee Valley Authority, which is actually in the wake of the Depression, 
we're going to be seeing Japan, you know, in Manchukuo, uh, and, and also working within Japan itself. We're going to be seeing the Soviet Union under this push, and it's going back to the land. It's going to be a very important part uh, of uh, so neo-colonization internally uh, during the interwar period. We also see, let's just see, move on, okay, a, a project which is being developed. This is uh, sort of the Your Africa. You can see how uh, Italy is uh, you know, way up there. The plan is the Balkans and then this triangle in the north of Libya that would then connect down to the Horn of Africa. This is a vision that's now being developed uh, by 1930 based on the fact that Italy has colonies already, a big one in Libya, not yet settled, uh, but and two small ones, Italian Eritrea and Italian Somaliland in the, in the Horn of Africa, but not the empire of Abyssinia. Okay. Uh, the, se the, the second dimension, okay, let's just go this, this, uh, this way, is commerce to connect uh, the Italian diaspora, the nine million people, Italian, who have emigrated, very important, it follows up from a free trade notion of an ethnographic empire that would be connected by ships and by airplanes. So very significant investments on the part of the Italian state in private enterprise, large firms, to build a very large merchant marine, which by the 1930s is in, but the, reckoned as the fourth in the world, that is the United States, Great Britain, uh, Japan, Norway, fifth, and, and then Italy. So, Merchant Marine, which is going connecting the Mediterranean okay, uh, to South America, to the United States, uh, to Buenos Aires, sh new ships that can get to New York City cross in six days, getting down to Durham in nine days, extorting, going, passing through. And this is part of a very powerful effort then to sort of still use free trade to reach out, complementing it with heavy propaganda to show to Italians abroad that they are still Italian and what the regime is doing, uh, to also voice complaints that we have this vital kind of informal empire and it's being disrupted by the protectionism of the, of, of the older empires. Notably, around, just look at the Suez Canal, every time Italy passes it with its great ships, you know, wacko, a very large uh, 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 amount has to be paid in term for passage. And here too, uh, in terms of, of, of of, of, of air transport. This is the end of the 1930s uh, when Italy is beginning to engage uh, heavily in commercial air routes. Okay? Again, piggybacking on military investment, nonetheless, with a very wide you know, angle within, uh, it, within, within Europe, cutting down into uh, Africa. That was very, very in, 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 important. Uh, and not beginning then to create a, another uh, sort of commercial s circuit. So this is a very, very important dimension, okay, a kind. And finally, third, uh, the, just so if you want to move back, um, it's also doing engaging in overseas colonization, not yet to settle uh, white uh, Italian settlers, but in this period to clean all, out the territory, uh, to uh, transfer populations who were sources of rebellion, uh, sources of unrest and low productivity because they were regarded as nomads uh, and therefore not capable of uh, you know, really using what had been <laughs> in the Roman Empire, the granary of the empire, that is the coast of Saranaica. And the main project, for, uh, which went on from 1929-1931, was to move uh, a pretty large part, it's hard to know exactly, maybe 80% of the Bedouin uh, uh, the, uh, of Saranaica uh, to uh, concept, what they call concentration camps, some with 20,000, all housed in a kind of Roman settlement, to lay it out from the air, all right, of tents, army tents usually, surrounded by their flocks and the men being introduced to labor, the women being introduced to the modern social services, and all public, all well-known, <laughs> documented, with compliments, if you want, from the International Labor Organization, which regarded as the first, you know, successful transfer uh, uh, of, uh, of, of, of nomads toward their effective settlement. Okay. So we see already in Italy now, in all of these cases, getting praise. In other words, this is a sign that Italy's on the move. Okay. It's in that moment, okay, just to go back here, that, Italy, that fascists come back to 
one of their, uh, if you want, hobby horses, which was corporatism. So here we now, population policies have been the main focus. And here, however, it begins to go back to the problem of representation of, late, of interest. Now that had been a big problem after World War I. Uh, one, um, uh, the, uh, which, which, which is to say that in most places it was regarded that liberal parliamentary representation, one man, one vote, was just a cause of nothing but trouble. <laughs> it, it dissatisfied the middle classes who never got enough votes. It terribly dissatisfied the conservatives who controlled parliament when it was an, an old boys club. And it g just gave a lot of wind uh, to the proletariat who nonetheless was never going to be able to take power because in the meantime all the interests were going behind the scenes. This is what Charles Mayer famously called corporatism uh, as a development in the restabilization of bourgeois Europe. So the fascists were on the ground. They drew on it from guild socialism. They drew on it from Catholic solidarism in the 1890s. They drew on it from aristocratic ideas of collaboration. Uh, which we usually associate with Bismarck, but there were similar kinds of figures without the Prussian dimension uh, in uh, nor northern Italy. And this is a project that the fascists ride. Once they've eliminated free trade unions, they swear they're going to be setting up labor, uh, 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 capitalist uh, uh, planning groups to negotiate wages. They publish a labor charter in 1927 saying that workers have rights uh, and capital has rights and above all the state has the rights that these join together. So already by 1927 Italy is unique in the world insofar as it's progressed. It's let drop pretty much in 27 when he shifts over to the population question to be brought up again in the depression 1934 when Italian corporatism, this is one of these gorgeous aesthetically gorgeous images on a book of uh, you know, probably about 70 pages, which lays it all out. It, clearly, you could say this is simply a facade. But what it does is it reattracts all the interests that those, for example, supporting the New Deal. Let's go see what fascist Italy is doing in the area of corporation. So that often the, the New Deal and the fascist corporatism became elided, as if they were aiming at the same idea. Roosevelt being able to do the New Deal because he was an authoritarian president and Mussolini able to foster this representation because he had eliminated liberal parliamentary types of representation. And this indeed added very much to the notion that fascism in its interest in corporatism as a way of representing interests, which could also be the interests of journalists, interests of families, interests of the school professors, and so on and so forth. There's a multiplication of all these interest groups, okay, uh, all getting sort of special privileges in the process, made fascisms generally then uh, sort of in the avant-garde. And this is very much helped when the Nazis come to power and say that they, through their labor front, are going to be engaged in a simpler type of organization. So this then promises to be a system that will have great following of Latin America and other areas of the globe. This notion of corporatism, fascist corporatism, right? Very flexible forms. Now, if we move along, all right, and I realize that time is getting quite short here, we would, might want to say, well, gosh, hmm, when the fascists go to war in, uh, let me go back here a second, okay, okay, right. 1935, the fascists go to war, okay, breaking with the League uh, in 1935. You would want to argue, and many historians have, that fascism has ceased to show its persuasive face. Okay? It's abandoned it for force. And thereby, it lost its credibility to Europe and globally as a leading model. Okay? Anti-fascism, they're so outraged, new colonial movements, huge riots and, you know, and, and demonstrations in New York City, which bring together communists and uh, people of color against this. In fact, okay, it doesn't become a rogue state. Okay? Mussolini bends uh, the question of the Ethiopian war into a just war, a legitimate war, okay? 
one that is indeed reinforcing of white privilege, of Western imperial uh, uh, emission. He lays it out, calling it fascist warfare, just as he's provoking okay, the first skirmish between the, uh, Ab uh, the kingdom of Abyssinia, Emperor of Abyssinia, and Italy in uh, the uh, January, early January 1935. Uh, and he's preparing them for the next several months. It will be, he says, okay, uh, uh, the first war to show uh, imperial warfare as legitimate, effective, and moral okay, in the sphere of international relations. It's, he's not going to bring Italy uh, to cause Habesian anarchy or to go rogue. It's a way to adjust peace, he would argue, uh, not w working through the corridors of the League. And he's forthright here. The right to empire belongs to the fertile, those with the pride and will to propagate. It's going to be a war, he says, which will be fought by the militia, okay? volunteer troops, not by black troops. It didn't turn out that way, or the regular army. It would be a war that would not be declared, because the argument is Ethiopia, even though it's a sovereign kingdom, okay? westernizing, okay? a member of the League of Nations, okay? covered uh, by, therefore, the League's protection, okay? is not a state. It's uh, uh, you know, a, a bunch of blacks. I mean, you use very uh, outface in terms of even uh, who are in need of civilization. They are Christians, okay, fine, but they're not Orthodox Christians. They are slave owning. Indeed, the most evolved of them, the Christians, are the slave owners. So a whole set of arguments is laid out in effect to face off anti-fascists, but also to say, face off that anti-fascists are going to be bond, bonding with anti-colonial movements in this period. So you could say the world is you know, a, 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 a flame with anti-fascism. Mussolini, Italy sanctioned uh, and organizes itself to fend off the sanctions. By the end, it, in, in six months, it, uh, Ethiopia has been occupied, the sanctions have been lifted, and Mussolini now finds himself a, kind of an arbiter of the new. Let me move then to this arbitration of the new. Here, we'll go back to, okay, here is a fine, spontaneous picture of a, a militia, okay, going off, okay. Uh, in, in, in November 1936, um, uh, Mussolini presents, if you want, another sort of remarkable fascist invention, and that's the axis. That's his term. Okay. He uses it. It's not only a political and diplomatic alliance, starting with accords with Germany in that year, 1936, but also economic and cultural. And in the next three years, from late 1936 to late 1939, it will see, if you want, pivoting around it, Portugal and Spain, Central Europe, and Latin American, several Latin American nations as well. In 1939, there will be accords with Japan, which form this war pact. Roosevelt, just to give you an idea, doesn't use that term axis okay, until, uh, get this right, uh, until November 1940. So well after when the United States is beginning to raise its head and in effect hasn't understood that this axis is mounting to a counter hegemony. Now, my colleague, a former student, Benjamin Martin, who teaches now at Uppsala, has written a, a marvelous work on the cultural arrangements uh, but that, that ensue from this, an enormous connecting of two very culturally rich countries, Italy and Germany, finding many things in common. He would argue that there were a lot of hack work done, second raters, a lot of you know, party types, but there were Nobel Prize winners that were involved. Uh, the um, famous Venice Film Festival is founded in 1932 by the fascists, is re-established uh, re to become the sort of centerpiece of this anti-Hollywood okay, from 1937. 
and Germany and Italy are sort of beginning to compete culturally in a very friendly way. So around this new order, uh, this, this axis, we're going to be seeing an extraordinary amount of activity, which by 1940 uh, has set laid the premises of what is called the European New Order. The European New Order, okay, you know, just you know, move on here. Okay, will once the war starts, it's Acme. You can be see, you can begin to see by 1930. Oh, I'm sorry. This, this is actually 1939. Um, uh, you can see the axis, the land in black. It's brought in Japan, in ja Japan, which also has similar kinds of pretensions to create a great, be, be a regional hegemon. Right? Here we can see 19, late, the maximum extension, 1942. In black is all the axis. Right? What we can't see is the influence which it has in India. Powerful you know, anti-colonial movements, Palestine, many other colonial countries which are sending groups to Berlin, where they are moving between Berlin, occupied Paris. I don't, it's hard to know whether they visit Italy or not, but are beginning to be attracted more and more to the Axis. So what we are seeing then is that by even as early as 1937 such distinguished international relations expert as E.H. Carr is beginning to say, as the Italians challenge British, whether they have real interest in the Mediterranean, which for Italy is life, he says, whereas for, it, for, for Vita, whereas for the British it's just a via to cut through you know, uh, uh, to, to India, he's beginning to argue, he says, gosh, you know, this emotion, these claims that we're hypocrite, okay, this moral, if you want, crusade that they're mounting, you know, how are we to doubt that this, this is not a realistic claim, okay, a claim that should in some sense be responded to? The big problem, he says, if we appease Italy, we're going to have to appease Germany too, and that combination is going to be much too difficult. So what I want to sort of end on this right moment now and then wrap up is to say that arguably by 1939, okay, Italy is in the forefront. Clearly, it couldn't be there without the Axis, particularly Germany with its wealth, uh, with its uh, econ as economic pivot of Europe, uh, with its own aggressive plans, with a similar kind of model with so much overlap, a lot of learning from one another about questions around race, a lot of competition, but we're basically seeing a kind of moment which is actually grows once the war starts, because the war then begins to mobilize all of this culture, all of this history, uh, all of these forces, where we could say that these, this regional pretension to hegemony has in some ways been successful. Okay. Uh, the war will clearly in the longer ter term, change that. And we can, you know, there are many arguments about how Italy sort of falls behind. You know, we, we know, you know, crazy pretensions of Mussolini to being a political leader. That's a kind of standard thing. The army with all of its squabbles, that's another kind of argument. But I think we also want to take into account that there was behind this project a very deep understanding of Italy's capacities in Europe and as a European power to advance a hegemonic agenda, right? capitalizing on the weaknesses of liberal Europe, and thereby, to, with respect to 1922, to be occupying an extraordinarily dynamic force okay, uh, by 1939. 1939, I cite that, that's the year that invades Albania. Okay, occupies Albania, I should say, and immediately sets to bringing all of the organizations, including the fascist women, to help you know, now civilize the Albanians. And that's also almost the month before when Franco triumphs in, uh, the, um, in Spain. New work uh, suggests how important Italy was supplying, convert with hybrid warfare, supplying troops, supplying uh, 
military materiel supplying Red Cross nurses, okay, noble women, lots and lots of correspondence uh, to that effort, particularly in the two, first two years before Germany finally joins in. Okay. So we're left here then with this, 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 uh, this understanding of this regional hegemony. You know, what happens with, with the war? Well, Italy is certainly not prepared. Italy becomes subaltern to German projects. It's subaltern in terms of sending labor to Japan, uh, to, to Germany. The very first day Italy enters the war, hey, what's happened to that demographic uh, empire, that ethnographic empire? Well, it turns out that 200 of its about 800 ships were in neutral or allied ports because its trade was still, if you want, with the, uh, uh, the with, with allied or neutral nations, w w which had been part of, if you want, the West and capitalist you know, global trade uh, before the fascists came to power. And it still was that way. And uh, about um, a third of the tonnage, the total tonnage, was immediately confiscated or interned, which gives some sense of the contradictions in this um, effort. Okay. What I want to conclude with, though, is that the war itself in no way stops, if you want, the projects. And we, so we will see Italy in 1943 advancing, it says, an alternative to the charter, uh, the Atlantic Charter, okay, which was much, much propagandized, the moment of Churchill and Roosevelt speaking about what the post-war new order would be, using, they use that word, the post-war new order, the Allies, and they advance a European charter, and what they're saying is sort of the same message, but to small European states, because they're afraid now that Germany will never negotiate, and they want to get out of the war, so they're advancing some notion of Italy being the biggest of the small states, and they would all be equal. Mussolini scratches out that they'll be, uh, uh, you know, th there will also be a big reform in labor capitalist relations. That seems much too uh, dangerous for uh, German consumptions. This cannot be published, however. The Germans censor it. And, you know, dre the dreaming goes on right to the very end that somehow you know, Mussolini will be able to you know, escape uh, to the Valtellina, the Alps, with his men, 10,000 of them, the militia. He will meet up with Hitler. Uh, and, uh, you know, they will sort of go into. Uh, you know, sort of quiet for as much time as needed before they resurge with uh, the idea that the new Europe will be necessary to defend against the Soviet Union on the one hand and uh, uh, British and American plutocracy on the other hand, which is trying to reduce the continent to an area of cheap labor and very significant history and resources. Thank you. Thank you very much for this fascinating lecture. And we have about 15, 20 minutes, 20 minutes for um, questions. I will take a cue. Uh, we will have people on both sides of um, the aisle to take your questions. And we will give priority to students first. So is there any brave student here <laughs> willing to ask a question? No? Oh, um. Okay, so we have one question here. And if you don't mind saying your name and your affiliation when you, before you ask the question, that would be greatly appreciated. Hello, my name is Dinara. I'm from Kazakhstan. I'm a fellow um, for Wiser Center for Europe and Eurasia. I just have a real quick question about, I read in some article there is an understanding as an organic democracy or authoritarian democracy, which kind of killed my brains. I couldn't understand the whole concept. And it was said that um, fascist governmentality was um, developing this concept. Um, I just wanted to try to understand if you were about this. Thank you. Oh, that's such a, a good question. I want to, so in, when Mussolini announces the Axis, he speaks of Italy um, and fascism as having the purest democracy anywhere. Um, and that you know, those who are opposed to it are uh, reactionaries so, uh, who, who don't believe in democracy. So you know, this idea of democracy is substantially divorced from, from liberal, liberalism. 
and you know you can think back to kind of sort of Aristotelian models of you know what what a democracy could could be you know it could be it could be you know or you know even the idea of a Jacobin totalitarianism in which you know, all of the people the will of the people is going to you know which we get taught in you know it's, it's sort of sometimes in seminars a right right wing interpretation of Rousseau says you know the idea of popular sovereignty is basically a dictatorship in which the whole are against the single so you know they, they, clearly they you know they, they 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 know all of that i mean they know that background to be able to speak of it as as a, a pure democracy yeah, you know, it's a, tricky words <laughs> not not to be taken for granted and, you know yeah. Julian Casanova, and I am the Distinguished Research Fellow at the Weiser Center for Europe and Eurasia. And I would like to ask you about the duality between consent and coercion. Uh. Because many people think or identify coercion with force, violence, and consent with consensus, institutionalization. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But in this kind of long dictatorships, I am thinking about Italy, but also about mm -hmm. Franco's Spain, the limits and borders between these two concepts are not that clear. No? Could you elaborate uh, yeah. something on that? Because there is a big difference between, between this idea of consensus by De Felice and the situation at the end of the... 1930s, the beginning of the 40s, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in Italy, mm -hmm. and the devastation, the final devastation, and the consequences of all of this for Italy. And so to, to call about consensus mm -hmm. is difficult. Right. I, I could see how, uh, very, just very briefly, um, here. So I tend to be a kind of old, old guard here. I think of Antonio Gramsci and the way he laid out that there are these two moments um, in, in, um, in, 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 in power, okay, that goes to make a state, which includes um, its people, civil society, and markets, and so on. There's the moment, if you want, of consensus, and then the, mo the moment of force, okay. But they're all bound up together. So the idea would be that, let's say, bourgeois comes to power, right, and it manages to create a society in its image to protect capitalism. Well, clearly, already behind it lies the force that it used to get to power. Okay. Social history, how the workers are made to work. There's the police apparatus. There's the, maybe the church. Okay. Maybe there's science also. So you know, the argument is, yes, they uh, are using consensus but behind them lies force. And then the question is, how much force okay, are they using to get, let's say, more consent? So here, in my case, I'd say fascists have got the big guys behind them, right? The ruling classes, in a broad sense, and middle classes who see their interests. Okay? They've used force to knock out working class representation, opposition, intransigent liberals, and now they've got this enormous force available. On that basis, knowing right, that there's, the, 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 there's, there can be no protests, they're able to begin to do a lot of organizing of what I would call consent. Now, it doesn't mean people love the regime in any way. They may be using the services. In any case, they don't have any real alternative unless they want to, so to speak, stay home. You know, they want to become... Uh, monks or, you know, or, or, or you know, just stay out of the public sphere altogether. So those who in the past have argued that Mussolini uh, created consensus, it, it's, it's sort of meaningless in, in the larger sense, unless you always bring in the question of that there is forces being used. But any state, if you want, any society mixes the two together. Fascism is going this new, what I'm saying here, new way, insofar as it's closed down traditional representation and it's adopting this governmentality which speaks of population, not in terms of rights, not in terms of politics. Okay? 
uh, and giving them what they want, even if it does probably create, if you want, consent uh, insofar as if you're a worker and you get a miserable wage and then they offer you all these services on the, if you, you're good and you don't belong to socialism and you renege, okay, there's clearly force uh, as well as persuasion involved. It's a very, these are tricky terms, like soft power. You know, oh yes, America uses soft power, soft power, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> it's able to do that because it has a monopoly over military force you know, pretty much coming out of the Cold War. And so the talk of let's use our soft power to do this, this, and this. Let's use our persuasive power. Nobody talks about the fact that there's kind of ongoing war. And in addition, once you begin wars like the War on Terror, it always produces a lot of persuasion. So when I say 1940, things don't stop. Oh, you know, new journals pop up all over Italy. Uh, tens of thousands will volunteer for the Russian crusade against Judeo-Bolshevism. Mussolini will volunteer 200,000 troops. Volunteer, not even by treaty, to Hitler to fight this crusade, you know, as part of you know, uh, the, the war. So the war itself generates this blah, 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 blah just as it does also in, in the Allied uh, nations, so much that they're able to overcome you know, the, the, these, the Allies. The first name is the United Nations. That's what it's called. They're able to overcome their um, there are big differences in the name of certain common uh, markers that uh, people can understand. Okay? So they don't have to choose, which they eventually do, between Russia, you know, uh, Britain, and, and the United States. So the, the terminology is, is in, this, in, in, this, in the United States, you know, we tend to sort of move around. A guy is, this new book of this Bruce Kuklik on um, Fascism Comes to America, and it's very useful to clarify, he's a very inter interesting historian who's worked mainly on American history. A, a, fine, a fine book, which is helpful on some of these definitional questions. Yeah. Hi there. Thank you so much for this mm -hmm. totally fascinating talk. I'm not really in this field, so forgive me. I'm really curious about what you um, would say about the continuity beyond 1940, the 1940s, and also where, the, where America and its support for anti-communist, yeah. sort of neo-fascist yeah. um, efforts in Italy and elsewhere in Europe, where that sort of fits in with your concept of fascist governmentality as sort of a third way between the United States yeah. and Russia. So does, yeah. does everything change with the Cold War? And is there a kind of realignment? Yeah. Oh, such an interesting question. Um, because that should have to be the con a conclusion. Mm. A lot of the new work says there's really just lots of continuity between the 1930s and the 1940s. So let's take Italy. The welfare state developed under the fascists pssst, continues through, heightened during the war. The fascists invest much more in mothers and infant care during the war. I mean, the high point, 1940-41, oh my goodness, these things are roaring. 42, 43, milk, distribute of milk, distribute this, and that. So that grows further, um, th that goes through. Uh, so just to take an example, when I did a study on this leisure, fascist leisure organization, I went to the old bureaucracy. It had been its name had been changed um, to the National Association for Leisure Circles. But in the 1970s, when I did my research, uh, you know, the man in charge of the office, who looks like these guys, because these are white collar, these are, these are managers, says, you know, huh, well, I won't say it's fascist, but it certainly didn't work better under fascism. So, you know, the idea is it no longer was a fascist organization. However, it was used by the Christian Democrats to um, oust communists from the clubs. You know, so, so there's parastate organizations with a lot of corporatism that continues. I mean, you could find all sorts of continuities. Um, you know, Mark, Mark Mazower found you know, how many SS personnel become the, 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 the enterprisers, you know, uh, norms enterprisers during the fat Nazis, and then they become advertising, going to advertising, salesmanship, all sorts of you know, managerial uh, and enterprise after the war. So you know, some of these very, very smart people operating on behalf of the fascists in all of these projects, like, for example, the last 
um, meeting on agri agri uh, it, 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 reforming international agriculture takes place in Switzerland, neutral country, albeit, but it's sponsored by, if you want the new order, all of those people end up in the uh, food and agricultural organization, you know, one, uh, you know, one kind of operation or another after the war because they, they move away, if you want, and the organizations are defascistized with, with some you know, slaps on the wrist. So the newer work, though, which I could draw on, on Germany, says, my goodness, you know, 1940, use the strong German currency and barter system to create a new uh, market area, which integrates Yugoslavia and all the, the Balkans in particular. You know, and commenting, uh, this is Stephen Grossman at, at, at NYU, um, commenting on that so much of the New Order project, including talk about European Union, European Charter, Yes, we point to the left having formulated like the Ventotene uh, Manifesto, but you could say that Italy's fasc char Carta Fascista, a uh, Carta Europea, hey, they're, they're all talking, the European Union is becoming a current word in before uh, the Allies occupied Milan in the Cordillera de la Serra. So there's a lot of shifting to the idea of a unified Europe against the Soviets and, and against and Britain and its empire. And you know, beyond that, the United States. So post-war, neo-fascists are very anti-American, very anti-NATO, and you know, gradually they'll come around, um, you know, over the long uh, over the long term. So, you know, it, it's interesting the the uh, you know the structural questions. And then you know, look at maps and, and, and Genevieve, and start looking at the map of the new order. Oh, gosh, it does look like the continental system of Napoleon, you know, with a heartland around the Ruhr, you know, northern Italy, and so on. And you go back to the Holy Roman Empire, there's this, this sort of spaces of continental Europe, uh, unified by Christianity and the marches, who, you know, with the worry about what's happening beyond Poland and Hungary, you know, Ukraine, mm, not really there because they're Orthodox and God forbid Russia. So, you know, there's a lot of continuities. And I think that we might think, and I'm trying to work out how do you say this is not memory and myth, discursive, when you go back and draw on mercantile traditions, which come out again and again uh, in, in Europe. Anti-Semitism, brilliant work. David Nirenberg, anti-Judaism, always there. You know, it's always since Paul of Tarsus. Anti-Semitism, well, that's recurrent. That's his argument, a lot of controversy about that as a way of you know, defining the crisis of Christianity. Go to fundamentalism and oh, you gotta have something heavy. <laughs> Judaism, rationality, anyway, these. So you know, the kind of ideas of Europe school is interesting because it's discursive. Yeah, but it also is you know, used discursively, uh, used uh, more than discursively, also politically, normatively, very, and, and, and sometimes probably, you know, policy notions, like the idea of a unified currency. I mean, you know, what a cuckoo idea. I mean, if, without having a bank behind it, but oh, we all embrace the idea, common currency creates equality, you know, forget the credit. You know, so, so there is a, you know, there, there is behind these material realities very deep set ideas about what's Europe and what its powers are, which, which, which come back and the new historiography suggests how powerful they were in, 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 Nazi, in, in, in the new order, when, especially when you begin to get elites from all over uh, saying that this is the only way we're going to get reform, you know, labor, corporatism, we're not going to be getting it if we follow the British. That's all the time we have. Oh, Unfortunately, dear. we have to leave the room. But uh, please join me in thanking, congratulating. Thank you. The